next presenter is Lauren Stewart, who is a prop master, prop restorationist, and baseball historian at History for Hire in Los Angeles, as well as a Dodgers tour guide on the weekends. Her presentation is titled Creation of Props for a Baseball Movie, and I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Hello, let me get my screen share up and I haven't been on Zoom in a while. I have to remember how to do that. All right, thanks guys. We're all good? <clears throat> Can everybody see me? Yeah? All right. Yep. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about propping up baseball uh, and the importance of bringing um, accuracy to baseball uh, uh, film and television and why that matters. Again, my name is uh, Lauren Stewart. You might know me as Tavi online. Um, I've written and um, done many articles under the name Tavi Kodiak. This is me uh, in my happy place at History for Hire. Um, this is going through the extensive collection we have there and cleaning and restoring that work. We'll talk a little bit about that process later. Here's some of the films that my company has been involved in, Eight Men Out, 42, 61, Moneyball, uh, both versions of A League of Their Own. We worked on the pilot on the TV show, uh, as well as some more recent things that we've worked on, Minx, Oppenheimer, upcoming Killers of the Flower Moon, and uh, Miss Maisel. Our company is known for a couple of things. We do general historic props and set decoration, um, but we're really known for our music collection. We have an extensive guitar collection. We're also known for our film and television selection. Uh, if you saw Miss Maisel, all of the film and TV in that last season, that was our stuff. Um, the boom mics, the television cameras, all that sort of stuff was ours. Um, yeah, we're also known for our baseball collection. And this was started before I joined, but I was brought on about two years ago to really renovate this collection and make sure that it was in tip top shape and ready for some upcoming projects that unfortunately haven't happened yet. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons, the strike being one of them. Um, but we have an extensive collection. It's well over about 3000 to 4000 pieces just in the baseball collection. Um, and then of course we have probably over a million different props in the warehouse. It's, it's pretty extensive. So let's just talk about a little bit of the basics. And I'm gonna use the movie 42 here. I didn't work on it, but my company did. Um, and also it's just one of my favorite baseball movies. So we'll talk about it. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit of different about the difference between props and set deck. This is a kind of a nitty gritty thing that people outside of the industry don't really think about. But if you think about different departments on a film and television show, each department has its own um, head of department, it has its own staff, it has its own interns and PAs and things like that, especially on a large film. And there is a difference between props and set decoration. And I'm gonna use this photo to il illustrate that. So here we have Harrison Ford starring as Branch Rickey, excellent casting choice in my mind. He, I think he did a great job. And um, we have everything on the screen that you see. So in the background, we see a lamp, we see a photo hanging in the background, we see some things on top of the table, we see the desk itself, that's all set deck. That's decoration, it's there to be pretty and to look and to build out the world. Then we see the things he's actually holding, right? He's got that piece of paper in his hand, he's got glasses on, he's got uh, the pencil in his hand. Those are props. So it's a weird distinction, but the pencil that's in his hand is a prop. The pen that is on his desk is set decoration. Now, those things can go back and forth. Something that an actor ends up picking up will go from set deck to props, but things never go from props to set deck. If it's a little confusing, don't worry. There are still people in the industry who don't get it either. <laughs> Next, we're going to talk about the difference between props and wardrobe, because sometimes a prop can be wearable. Again, this is from 42. That's Chadwick Boseman there starring as Jackie Robinson. And just to give the short end, if you wear it, it's a it's wardrobe. If you hold it and use it, it's a prop with some exceptions. So he's wearing a baseball hat right now. And of course they didn't wear batting helmets at the time. That's part of his wardrobe because he wears it almost all the time. If he was wearing a batting helmet, he does not wear that all the time. So that would become a prop. Same thing with the umpire and the catcher. The, the clothes that they're wearing, that's wardrobe. 
the gear that they're wearing, the shin guards, the chest protectors, the face mask, those are props. And again, if it seems a little confusing, don't worry. I've had people who I've worked with on multiple shows not quite get it. Now, sometimes these are negotiations between, hey, can you take over the batting helmets? I need to focus on this. Or, hey, can you alter this chest protector because I need it to fit, but I don't have the skills to do it. So these are negotiations that happened between props and wardrobe all the time. Um, and that's just a little bit of a breakdown of the difference between set deck, props, and wardrobe. For this presentation, we're just going to talk about the props. So what does this process look like? Um, when you start on a film, the very first thing they do, um, aside from getting your contract signed, uh, they send you a script. And it's your job as a prop master to read the script and get an initial read on what you think the props uh, are going to be. So we're going to take a look at a script page from a friend of mine. This is Jenna Butler's script. Unfortunately, it has not been made yet, but uh, this is a world that um, in this world, there is a major league baseball team in Nashville, Tennessee called the Elephants. So that's just all you need to know uh, background wise. I'm going to read through this really quickly and then we're going to break it down. So exterior, Frank's Hot Dog Stadium, Nashville, Tennessee, evening. Out on the field, Stephen Yu, the elephant's beleaguered reliever, stands on the mound, utterly defeated. He looks to Rollo for a sign. Keeps shaking him. Joe Sutter, the announcer, says, After last night's exhausting bullpen game, the Nashville relievers are a weary bunch. And I gotta tell ya, if I'm Rich Dillinger, I wouldn't be burning my best arms right now. Charlie Green, another announcer, says, I think the only question is which position player is he going to throw to the Wolves? Whack! Another base hit. In Nashville's dugout, Elephant manager Rich Dillinger, former champion, currently coasting, has seen enough. He looks at the visibly flummoxed pitching coach, who shrugs. I don't know, says the pitching coach. Pick one. Useless, says Rich Dillinger to himself. Hernandez, grab a glove. Startled, Hernandez momentarily hesitates, but then springs into action. In his nervous excitement, he almost bumps into Garrett Cartwright, a handsome but tarnished god, ignoring the cracks that show his mortality, who crouches at the rail, exuding a major piss-off vibe. Dillinger gets to the mound, takes the ball from you, dismissing him. Dillinger and the other players pat him on the back as he begins the slow trudge back to the dugout, what's left of the stadium crowd booing him. The Nashville shortstop glances out to the bullpen, then sees Hernandez. He sighs, knowing what's coming, hoping it won't be him. Dillinger looks around, almost seeming to eeny meeny until his gaze lands on Eli. All right, so this is a script page that we've been given. From this, we need to be able to extract what props we need to make and or either make or acquire for the shooting of this one page, just one page of script. So when we're looking at this, there's a couple things in here that give us a clue. This OS that's next to Ch Joe Sutter and Charlie Green, that means they're off screen. That means they may be part of the scene, they may be at the ballpark, but they're physically not on screen. And for these purposes, we ignore them completely. We don't have to do anything. So any microphones, whatever props they have, we don't have to deal with that. So next we have Steven Yu and Hernandez, and their name, are, their name is in capital letters. This means that's the first time we've seen these players, these characters on the screen, Steven Yu and Hernandez. We also have Rich Dillinger and Garrett Cartwright who are in, who are in capital letters, but there's a difference between them. Steven Yu and Hernandez, they're just kind of mentioned in passing. Rich Dillinger and Garrett Cartwright, they have the parentheticals, right? They have a little more description. Their character is fleshed out a little bit more for them. And it's not necessarily visually fleshed out. It is emotionally fleshed out, right? Former champion, currently coasting. That's not really something you can, it's more of a note for the actor themselves and to get a sense of the reader, to get a sense of the character. That means they're probably main characters. That means this is the first time we've seen people who are going to be probably throughout the script. Then we have characters uh, Rollo and Eli. They're not capitalized, but they are named. This means that they have been in previous scenes in the script. So this might be page 10, this might be page 50. We don't know. But they are in other pages in the script. 
They have been introduced elsewhere. We need to make sure that we are matching any props that might carry on from those scenes to these scenes. So we need to look back through the script, look back through our notes and see, is there anything specific? So Rollo's a catcher, right? He should have his like specific gear. Specific gear. We want to make sure that doesn't change color or change um, change style significantly, unless it's a character note that we specifically have to do that. We want to make sure we keep that continuity. Then there's also pitching coach Nashville shortstop. Right? These are characters, but they don't have a name. Uh, he does have a uh, the pitching coach does have a line, but he doesn't have a name. That means they're not really important. This might be their only scene. Um, they're probably not a name actor. They're probably a featured extra, somebody they just kind of pulled off on the day from the extras pool to be somebody. They may be cast, but they're not very important. So that's what that means. And they may or may not be in other places in the script. So now that we've gone through all of that and you've looked at the scene, you know who the characters are and you have a general sense of the idea of who the characters are, what props are specifically pulled out on this page? So an AD, an assistant director, when he's writing up the plan for the next day, we call it a call sheet, they'll often read through the script and they'll say, oh, okay, I see this prop, I see this prop, I see this prop. I'm going to put that on the call sheet because that's important. So this is what someone who has nothing no idea about baseball and no idea about props what they would look at this script and say oh, okay we need one of these and for this scene with all this going on the only thing that's called out ball it's just ball that's the only thing that is specifically called out to be um in this script now we as baseball folk know we need a lot more than ball right it mentions Hernandez's glove, but it never says he grabbed it, right? That's important. Things like that can trip you up. So ball. So now we have to approach the script as a baseball person, right? As a baseball uh, consultant, this would be something that you would, if, if your prop master doesn't know about baseball, this would be something that you would talk to them about. So let's go kind of through the script as it's mentioned. Uh, these are implied props that we know are going to need to be there based on just the business of doing a baseball game. Steven Yu, he needs his glove, right? He probably needs a rosin bag. Rollo, the catcher, he needs a mask, a chest protector, a glove, shin guards. Depending on what era they're in, he might need a pitch com. The umpire needs a mask, right? The umpire needs a chest protector, shin guards, that sort of thing, all the other accoutrement that umpires may have. You need a baseball bat. It wasn't called out in the script, even though it said whack. There was no baseball bat listed, so you have that. You have your ball, as mentioned. You better have that if it's called out on the script. Uh, you've got your batter's helmet and their protective gear. You've got Hernandez's glove. You're assuming that he does grab a glove. Hopefully he, he's professional enough to do that while heading out to play. You have the other elephant players, right? You need a first base. You need three infielders. You need three outfielders gloves in addition to the, the other gloves we've already mentioned. You need the crowd, food and drink, right? It mentions what's left of the crowd. You need to know how many people is that crowd? Well, what's left? Is that 100 people? Is it 1,000 people? You know, 100 people at a small ballpark might seem like a lot, but 100 people at a professional, or even 1,000 or 2,000 people at a professional major league venue, that feels like very few too, but you need to know. You also need to know if those people are fully real or not. Sometimes they'll be CGI. Sometimes you have to provide models of any props you give them to a modeler so they can build them out. You need programs, scorecards, especially depending on the era that you're in. Uh, they may have fans or other giveaways like towels or signs or any, any sort of thing like that. And also, believe it or not, uh, bullpen gloves and bases. You cannot guarantee that the, even if you're shooting at a ballpark, that the bases are going to be what you need just this year, right? We have bigger bases in Major League Baseball in the, for the 2023 season. So if this is set in 2022, you better have the smaller bases. If this is set in the 1940s, you better have your canvas bags, right? So those are all of the things that as a baseball person, we know that we need to see um, just kind of in the scene. Now, we need to fully and more largely flesh out this world. So we need to expand our view. We need to think about the bigger picture of a baseball diamond. 
And these are more passive plot props that we need to be able to pull from. These are conversations we might have with the director based on things that they want to see uh, on with our assistant director based on the type of extras they're going to be getting and also with wardrobe. And uh, so these are these are conversations you have to have to determine if these things are going to happen. So you need the other players, right? The other team the other team that's batting you need their helmet you need their batting gear right is there someone in the on deck circle do they have the weights do they have the sprays you know that sort of thing that they're interacting with and picking up and using in the dugout do you have bubble gum do you have snacks do you have coolers your set decoration person might get a cooler they are not going to check to see if it's food safe that is not their job that's your job as the prop master to make sure that any food or drink or anything like that are food safe uh, the coaches will have clipboards, tablets, notes, again, depending on the era that you're in. You're going to have lineup cards th that you're looking at. Uh, are there stadium security guards, right? Usually there's a security person near the dugout. Are they going to need radios, that sort of thing, a, a gear belt or something like that? Are there media and cameras in the camera well? Uh, do they need microphones? They need uh, regular cameras. They need still cameras. Do the press and security need badges? These are all things that you have to think of as a prop master to be able to do the scene correctly and properly. Uh, but again, the only thing that was called out in that script was ball. So that gives you the idea of the amount of work that you have to do. So let's talk a little bit more about those characters we mentioned, right? Um, and how there's different levels of attention we need to pay to them. So here's four gloves. Um, on the left, we have an actual replica. Uh, or, sorry, we have an actual glove from the 1930s. Sorry, not a replica. 1930s. Next to it, that kind of brown and tan, that is a very poorly made replica. We purchased this on spec. We were not super happy with it, but it is the right shape. It does work. It's technically fine. Next to it, we have a very, very nice, that tan color, a very, very nice replica. It's well made. It's well put together. It, it, we were able to condition it well. It's, it's great. And then on that very side, that dark brown, we have a replica that's been made in the wrong leather. It doesn't look very good, but it will get the job done. So for these things, your Garrett's, your Rich, right? Your, your main characters who have description, they're going to get that really excellent replica. They're going to need to use the glove. They're going to need to, to, to interact and move with it and have it be reliable. That's where you spend the most money is on your main characters. Now, someone like Hernandez, who we never really see, you know, we see him grab a glove and just kind of run out. That's where we might put in our actual uh, glove. It looks good. It's not going to have to function a lot, although all of our all of our period gloves are functional, but it's not going to get as much wear and tear on it as something a main character would use. And then we have characters like our outfielders, right? You, you, you never see them. They're not really going to come in for the mound meeting, potentially. They're going to be so far in the distance that they just need to be a blob. That's where you can use those less good replicas, either the absolutely terrible one or, you know, the the one that's that's made out of the wrong thing as long as you're not seeing them later in a shot where they have to make the game winning catch or something like that these are okay to give them because they're literally just blobs in the background standing out there uh, so your next step is research and um your, your original sources are best this is our library at history for hire um we want to use catalogs we want to use first-hand accounts we don't always want to trust books because sometimes they're not right we'll get to that um these are magazines, our extensive collection of magazines. Yes, I have already gone through 88 and found the Oral Hershiser um, Sports Illustrated Award. I love it. Anyway, or Sports Illustrated is you. Loved it. Um, but you want to use original sources whenever you can. Because just for instance, this is one very nitpicky incident. But guys, your Sabre, your IWBC, you love those nitpicks. So we're going to talk about it. You're looking for a first base glove in 1941. And you have a character who is like this rich guy top of the line everything needs to be the best you need to find him the coolest most awesome glove on the market in 1941 and you find a 19 um but you have conflicting sources of information you find a book that says that the trapper style model of the glove from rawlings was uh patented in 1942 and that's when it was first available but then you find this advertisement and you kind of find a general 1940s. You're like, okay, that's the new thing in the 1940s. But when did it come out? Was it 1942? Ah, if it's 1942, that's not really going to work for us, right? But then you find another ad, and this is from an original 
um, Rawlings ad that says the hit of 41 and 42, which means it was available in 41. And then you do a little bit more digging to find out, oh, if you look in that first one you saw, it says patents applied for. So it was available to the public in 41, but the patent wasn't granted until 42. Nitpicky, yes, but that is what I live for, and I'm sure some of you live for as well. So then you have to think about the other end of the, like, because uh, this glove model uh, gets modified, right? Throughout the years, it gets modeled and changed. In 1951, uh, Major League Baseball was concerned that they would loosen those laces in between so much that it would get bigger and bigger and bigger, that they had to introduce a web control strap uh, to keep it within Major League um major league regulations and therefore a couple of different other regulations um and that came in in 1951 so you need to be able to know that if you can get a glove that looks like the ones over here sorry i'm not sure which direction it is for you um the the gloves that look like the trapper model models from the 40s but once you get into the 50s once you get to that web controller strap that's not going to work for something that you need to know it's nitpicky but hey again that's what we live for so you do that over and over and over again for every piece, especially with a period piece, right? That's where you bring in someone like me uh, or someone else who is a baseball historian and a consultant, and they can help make those decisions for you. So eventually, when you get down to it, you have usable, workable pieces that um, that are available and, and good to, to the era that you're working for. Um, so I'm going to keep on flying. Uh, so this is a little bit about the restoration work I did. Uh, first of all, I documented everything. For a while, my phone, it was like two cat photos and glove photos, hundreds and hundreds of glove photos. I took probably, depending on the complexity of the glove, I took anywhere from 20 to 100 pictures of the glove, just making sure I could document and get these gloves back together. And you're like, well, don't you have all these catalogs that you could look up? Well, yeah, sometimes the catalogs are terrible. This is an original catalog. And if you can tell me the lacing pattern on those gloves based on that photo, I'll send you a cookie. The next thing is cleaning, careful cleaning. I developed something I call baseball snot. Uh, it is a mixture of a very mild Castile soap, um, a leather conditioner, um, a leather cleaner, and water. It's very effective. As you can see, I actually used an electric toothbrush on it. Um, it's gross, but it works, and I really enjoyed doing that. It's a very satisfying process. It takes something that might look like an antique and cleans it up into something that's usable. I also did a little bit of dye work. Uh, this is a water dye. A lot of the gloves we have um, were, were sun damaged, um, and it just leached the color out, and it made it look old. Our goal is we want something that's usable in the now. So if you're set in some, your, your movie set in 1970, we want to hand you something that looked new for 1970, not a glove now from 1970, if that makes sense. So we want to make it as usable and as new looking as possible. That also sometimes requires replacing the padding. This is a very old catcher's mitt. It was a youth catcher's mitt. Uh, the padding was absolutely decimated. You do have to be careful when renovating old gloves. Some of these gloves used asbestos as padding. What a great thing. Um, this was not asbestos. We did have it catch. This is just some really, really, really gross um, felt stuff. It was gross. Anyway, uh, I made a new one. This is industrial felt. This isn't the final shape. I ended up shaping it a little more, but this is kind of the rough end, making sure that it fit. And at the end, you have a nice and usable catcher's mitt again. You also have to take care of the hardware. Honestly, Pinola. Pinola is your friend. Pinola is your buddy. Uh, this did a lot. It's not going to be. It's not going to be damaging to the leather. You want to clean it off. You want to make sure it doesn't stay on there. But if a little bit gets on there, it's not going to damage the leather, and it's very easy to clean up, and um, and you get great results. So just to give you a scale of the project I walked into, this is the um, the glove collection. We called this Fort Baseball. I barely saw my coworker Dave's face. He works at the bench across from me. I barely saw him for a couple, almost a year. <laughs> but uh, just to give you a scale, this is all the adult gloves that I worked on. And uh, that is our collection of youth gloves to give you an idea of the scale. So this is the end result. We want to be able to, anytime from the start of baseball in the 1800s, all the way up to 1980 is our cutoff right now. We, we, we focus on 1980s. We want to, if you give us a year, say 1934, we want to be able to give you two full teams worth of baseball clubs. And that is what we, we have ended up doing. Almost any era 
that you come into were a little light on the 1890s, but um, any era that you come in, especially from 1900 on, uh, we're able to give you a full and complete set of two teams that can play each other for real on a baseball field. And uh, it's fun work, I'm not gonna lie. It's really enjoyable work. I like doing it. Um, I hope we have more baseball projects. I did end up staying on the company. I've become their typewriter specialist. I'm also their soft goods and leather goods specialist. Um, but I am totally ready for the new League of Their Own to come get props for us <laughs> um, if that happens. And there's a couple other projects that unfortunately also were victims of the strike. But um, we are ready to go and um, hopefully you'll see some of our work on the big screen soon. Thank you. Those are awesome photos. That was so cool. Uh, we did have a few questions in the chat. Um, how do you acquire your items? <clears throat> so, yeah, um, a couple different ways. We actually got a large portion of gloves from Warner Brothers. So Warner Brothers is probably the largest prop house in the world. It's massive. It's so cool to wander through. Um, <clears throat> but they try to keep their stuff current because if you think of the majority of their shows they're modern shows right and only maybe one or two period films because a modern show is actually a lot less expensive than period shows so occasionally big prop houses will have massive sell-offs of inventory and will purchase that that's actually how we ended up with the uh the karate kid chest plate with the with the bullseye on it we acquired that in a a, a purchase from from warner brothers um but when we're doing a project i'm going to tell you we were working on field of dreams before it got um put on hiatus the new field of dreams um for that we had to match specific ones one of the gloves you know they the we had to do match the black socks gloves um so you know ray shulk that sort of thing so that is a mix of scouring ebay uh, a lot of the stuff we already had in our collection, which was great. Uh, but I also get in touch with collectors sometimes. Um, I have had some flack from from collectors about the renovation work I do because, you know, in their mind, original is best, right? Not so much in our work. So I have to have a very careful discussion with collectors about um, being honest about, no, I'm going to renovate this. I'm going to dye it. I'm going to clean it. I'm going to relace it, that sort of thing. Um, but my my process is like we're not working on Mickey Mantle's glove. We're working on a glove that someone slapped Mickey Mantle's name on and gave it to Sears, like sold it like mass market through Sears. So like, but I do I am very open with collectors like, hey, this is going to be a usable, workable glove because I also need to get a glove from them that would be in that condition to be able to work. Um, how do you protect against rust mold? Um, yeah, so our biggest thing is storage. We store them in plastic bins. I do go through them every couple months. We actually had a problem with spew. Um, it was called fatty bloom is another reason, uh, uh, part of it. It's just something that happens to uh, leather that's been over oiled. And a lot of people really like to over oil gloves because that's, you know, they don't really think about it. They just want that, especially like the grease pocket ones. Um, but there's a condition that whether it's, uh, there's not a lot known about it. I tried to read a paper about it. It was way too scientifically dense for me. Um, but basically a certain um, atmospheric condition happens where the fat and the oil that has oversaturated the leather starts to leach out and crystallize. And it looks like mold, but it's not. It's like a sandy, if you look at it really close, it's like a crystalline thing. So actually a lot of people are like, oh, it's a moldy glove. It's probably not mold. It's probably fatty bloom. And, but it's a really easy process. There's literally um, a box called a, a spew remover and it stops that chemical reaction from happening and it seals it um, and it kind of protects it for long. Of course, no renovation we do, no cleaning we do is permanent. That is the thing I have learned the most at working at a prop house. No solution, no fix is permanent because if things are gonna continue to de deteriorate no matter what. But what we do is we try to preserve for as long as possible and keep them working and usable for as long as possible. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit about your background and how you got into this work? Sure. Um, I went to film school and I thought I was going to be a writer. Um, and I do write some, but uh, excuse me, everyone there thought they were going to be a producer or a director or writer as well, and no one wanted to build the props or the sets or anything. So I came out of college with an amazing portfolio, said, okay, that was great. I'm going to go be a producer. 
and I joined a company um, uh, run by David Ladd, if you're familiar with the Lads. His brother Alan Ladd ran uh, WB through some pretty good years. Uh, got that job, immediately the 2007 writer strike happened, and I lost that job. Uh, fell back into props. Uh, got involved in leather specifically to um, to do a project, a, a, a ballet of Oklahoma, so the the ballet dancers could wear real guns on their hips. Very stupid ask, but I did it, and I made it safe, and it happened. Um, and and then I got this job specifically at History for Hire in the most Hollywood way. I was really nice to a woman on a plane, and we ended up uh, getting stranded on the tarmac in Burbank so long that me and several other people, we got a hotel room together in Phoenix for the night. She happened to be working on Ant-Man, um, I had just been working for a company that did miniatures. She gave me a call when she needed leather stuff. Long story short, I ended up working on the Fablemans with Steven Spielberg. Um, I made several props for that. When I was making these pom-poms, which never made it into the film, but I was working on these pom-poms, I went to History for Hire. Uh, it was during playoffs, so I was in full Dodger gear, and she was like, uh, Pam, uh, Elie, the owner there, was like, oh, you do leather work and you like baseball. And I was like, yes, I do. And she said, well, we have this collection. What do you think about renovating it? And I've been working there for two years now. Not just, again, not just on the baseball, but on um, all their soft goods. I'm learning I'm learning typewriters. I'm learning um, basically um, any small motor um, thing like um, um, records, radios, that sort of thing. That's so cool. Thank you so much for sharing.